Good afternoon, everyone. For the MASH webinar on Indian multinationals resilience through effective risk management. We will be starting our program soon. Good afternoon and a warm welcome to all the participants. We'll be starting our program in less than a minute. We have a number of uh, people still joining in and we will start in the next 30 seconds or so. Great, once again, a very, very warm welcome to all the participants for the MASH webinar on Indian Multinationals Resilience Through Effective Risk Management. I'm Sanjay Kedia, CEO of MASH India, and I have with me a very impressive panel of practitioners who are practicing risk management and are risk managers for some large Indian corporations. I have some seniors from our Marsh regional office, and I'll be introducing the panel shortly, but let me take the opportunity to welcome each and everyone for this Marsh webinar. Let's roll the slides and we'll start our program. It's good to start the program on time. You all know how to use Zoom with the amount of uh, lockdowns and working from home. Uh, please participate uh, by asking a question or raising a comment during the entire program. Uh, do not wait for the end of the program. Uh, you could type in your question at any time. And also please participate in the polls. We have a number of polls during the program. It will keep 
your engagement high and will give a lot of insight as to what all of you are thinking. Next. Today's uh, program is around risk resiliency. We all know that the risk is changing in this environment. What is the big change around the risk? The bigger, one of the biggest change around the risk is we're in a hyper-connected environment. We are all connected in terms of the way the entire world works, the business works, and that is amplifying the risk in a very different way. And two, the existing tools which we have for the risk management are not sufficient enough. So therefore, this whole conversation on risk resiliency is, is really rising. And Marsh is doing a lot of work around this theme. The four drivers of resiliency which uh, will be touched upon. One is on, can you anticipate, or is your organization having a culture and mechanisms that you are in a better position to anticipate than the others? Are you able to develop forecasting capabilities? And more importantly, how agile are you when a risk event was to happen? How do you respond to those events? And it's clearly a competitive advantage if you are able to respond and deal with the risk event superior than the others. And we have seen this during COVID. There are companies which have responded extremely well to a situation and they've grown bigger. And there are companies uh, which are fighting for survival or have gone for extinction. So these are realities which we and we are faced with a big risk event. And how do you collaborate with your entire ecosystem to manage risk? Are the big differentiators, how do you handle this uh, risk resiliency? Next. Marsh released a risk resilience report recently. It was a global re release and it would be an annual affair going forward. So we are putting a lot of commitment at the global level where over thousand corporations, companies participated in a survey, extensive survey, and some very interesting findings that while risk resiliency is important, are you measuring them? Only 10% of them are measuring across the entire enterprises. Are you integrating with your strategy? Uh, not many are doing. Uh, and even some of the largest firms, uh, you will find that the integration of the strategy is lacking the importance the risk resiliency is receiving in that conversation. And two big risk items, the regulatory risk and the emerging tech, which are were rated as a top risk items. But in terms of preparedness, uh, the lack uh, was quite significant. So what it shows is that this is an issue which is very much on the table and the agenda at the board level and the risk committees and everywhere. But the preparedness is not up to the speed. And that's where uh, we need to work together to take uh, this conversation and the dialogue forward. Next. So we have with us uh, a very impressive panel. Uh, today's uh, speakers, we have uh, Gurpreet Singh Jolliji. We all know uh, he has been uh, managing uh, the risk and insurance program for Sun Pharmaceutical, uh, and, and he's very well known to the risk and insurance market. Uh, Nitin Nair, uh, group head for insurance for the RPG group. Uh, he recently took this responsibility. Prior to that, he was leading that uh, function or uh, managing risk and insurance for the Simmons India. We have Paul Wilkins, uh, our chief client officer from Marsh Asia, also leads our large client practice, uh, and which we call as a risk management. And Adam Weekly leads our multinational client service leader for the entire Asia. And we know today's program is about Indian multinationals, how are they managing the risk? And we also have the leader of India Indian multinational business uh, leader for Marsh India, Pranav Patel on the panel. So with this, I hand over to, to Pranav Patel to take these conversations forward. Pranav, over to you. Thanks, Anjay. So today's uh, agenda is uh, very relevant, relevant and pertinent in today's uh, world. Um, uh, we'll be starting with two poll questions followed by a snapshot of the Indian multinational companies and the emerging landscape in this space followed by uh, Paul Wilkins talking about the evolving risk landscape, challenges with new age risk manager. We've seen that uh, new risks like infectious diseases, cyber risks, 
are on the horizon uh, in this evolving risk landscape. So Paul will talk about uh, you know these new risks and uh, you know the challenges that a risk manager faces. Uh, Adam Wakeley will be talking about the risk management approach and the Marsh advantage. Uh, we're finding that the risk management approach of Indian multinationals is evolving from decentralized to a control master program. That's where we aim to be. That's the eventual, I'd say, the end goal. And the Marsh advantage in terms of tools and techniques that Marsh provides to place and execute control master programs. Followed by that will be the panel discussion and then a Q&A. So we we'll move on to uh, the first poll question. Is expanding business into the global arena the new mantra for large Indian corporations? As you can see, 98% of the participants have said yes. And clearly, you know, the consensus is that uh, going global is the mantra for growth going forward. Can we go to the next uh, poll question? Now, which of the following regions are witnessing investments, large-scale investments by Indian multinational companies? Asia, Australia, and New Zealand, uh, the European Union, Middle East and Africa, North America, all of the above. Now, again, uh, you know, uh, as expected, uh, Asia and the Middle East, as well as Africa, have been the top destinations for Indian multinational companies. Uh, there's also uh, a fair amount of interest in the European Union and some interest in North America. But Asia, the Middle East and Africa, as uh, you know, correctly uh, you know, uh, shown by the poll results, is the top investment destination for Indian multinationals. Uh, next slide, please. Now, to, just to give you a snapshot of uh, the expanding global footprint for Indian uh, MNCs, uh, you know, just some high level statistics. We've seen the equity outflow has been uh, around 64 billion in the last decade or so. And that excludes actually the last year and a half, which is uh, because of the pandemic. Now, 70% of the equity has been invested in subsidiaries, and uh, the rest is JVs. We've had 80 plus corporates that have invested more than $2 million each in the last decade. Uh, again, uh, investment destinations we've already discussed in your. Know, You've seen the poll results. It's largely uh, within Asia and Africa and the UAE, followed by a bit of interest uh, in uh, the European Union and North America as well. Top sectors have been the DFSI, manufacturing, agriculture, retail, communication services. And you know, the average exports of goods and services as a percentage of the GDP has been approximately uh, 29% in the last five years. On this note, I'd like to invite Paul Wilkins to take the next two poll questions and speak to you about the evolving risk landscape. So over to you, Paul. Is, is the poll complete, Hannah? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It's complete. Okay, and then I think there's one more poll question, right? Yeah, that's right. So as you can...
Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, in interesting polling questions. Uh, I I'm, I'm not sure if any of the uh, responses were surprising to any of you uh, guys in India. Uh, prob probably not. But um, but I, I was amazed at that first question. Um, that 98% of, of companies, and I guess you, the companies you're representing on this call, are all looking to expand internationally, um, globally. Uh, I think that's a sort of stunning number. Obviously, in India, you have an enormous domestic market, um, yet I guess it reflects the ambition of Indian companies that you know, even the enormous domestic market is not enough, and you know, you're all looking uh, to increasingly expand uh, globally. I really think that's sort of stunning. Um, so yeah, in interesting. See, you know, you know, a lot of the investment is you know close to home in Asia. Um, I, I guess close to home in in Middle East and in Africa. But I, I guess that's a sort of first wave. Um, I was a little bit surprised to see the sort of low um, expectation of investments in the U.S. Um, I know that's been a difficult market, but we can certainly see in North Asia, Japan and Korea and Taiwan and so on are, are ramping up investments in. Uh, in, in the US now. Uh, but it's interesting also to reflect that you couldn't, you, you all reflect um, that, you know, you, you recognize that by expanding globally, you know, you are creating a more complex uh, risk environment. So I've just got seven or eight minutes to sort of just run through um, some areas. So maybe we just jump to the next slide, um, uh, um, Pranav. Um, so, uh, so Sanjay mentioned earlier that sort of um, your know, Marsh had done a similar survey. We surveyed our global clients around risk resilience, kind of what, we, what they were thinking. And, and I'll play back a little bit of that to you. Um, you know, this is a different um, one from the World Economic Forum uh, that Marsh are a sponsor of, but they all kind of point us in the same area. I know we're going to leave these slides with you, so I'm not going to kind of go through piece by piece. I'll, I'll talk about the findings from the at a high level um, of, of the uh, Marsh response. So I think. Um, for all of you, you know, representing risk and insurance for Indian multinationals, you know, your job has become a lot more complicated in, in recent years. You know, all of the things you've always focused on, the, uh, the fire loss, the NAT cat losses, uh, accidents uh, to employees, legal liabilities, all of those things still exist just like they did before in some ways maybe maybe greater so you've got to manage all those things but you've also got all of these new things that you need to sort of focus on now and some of them look like quite difficult to put our arms around and, and manage so let me just sort of reel through the things that the marsh uh, risk resilience diagnostic pointed us um, towards that all companies globally are thinking about so in, in no special order uh, but number one cyber so cyber, you know, none, you know, none of us can read the media. You cannot go a week in the media without seeing of a new sort of cyber attack somewhere. There was the recent event, um, I think, in, in Norway, where there was like a thousand convenience stores that were closed down by an attack on the point of sale um, equipment through, through, the, through a supply chain and through Microsoft. Um, software. So it just shows that you know, you know, we're all vulnerable to this. And it's not just about privacy anymore. It's not about losing customer data anymore. It's about you know, people can attack your systems and close them down. And ransomware you know, is an enormous problem um, for us. So cyber very much on everybody's mind. Um, climate, again, same thing. You cannot open a, a newspaper or read online um, you know, for more than a few days without reading about um, climate issues. And we've seen the you know, heat waves in the US, these amazing floods in Germany, uh, unbelievable floods going on in southern China where they nearly had a dam collapse. But you know, the frequency and the severity of these events, you know, anecdotally at least, it really seems that it's kind of increasing everywhere. So as you expand globally, you've got to keep an eye on these things. Um, you know, climate is just part of the ESG story. And again, you know, ESG is kind of very prominent to everybody now. So ESG, of course, is more than climate. Um, it's about things like um, you know, racial injustice and gender inequality and the governance that you're all putting around that. So you, know, you have to manage that in your India environment. But as you all become global, you've got to make sure you can manage that in your international environments as well. It's very complex. It's evolving uh, all of the time. But you have to make some efforts to kind of put a measurement uh, around that. Um, you know, the geopolitical exposures. And um, again, you know, we see all these global sort of pressure points um, you know, between the US and China. Um, and, and, and all sorts of unusual things can happen. You know, we saw in the media recently, uh, like an unbelievable story, like uh, you know, Unilever 
who um, obviously very, very focused on ESG, they have this Ben and Jerry's ice cream. They got themselves into a big problem because they stopped to selling it in the, um, in the Palestinian occupied territories. So, you know, what a, like the risk manager of Unilever could never probably have imagined that this was an issue that the company was going to have. But these are the type of things that you guys as risk managers need to, to be thinking about these days. Pandemic, you know, we, we live with it every day. Um, it's kind of a bit too late to do too much about COVID, but you know, all the scientists tell us that, you know, this is not the end of it and we can expect more and greater frequency and maybe even worse pandemics. So how do we kind of think about that and how do we prepare for those things um, in the future? Um, emerging technology was the fifth one. Um, and then emerging technology, we have robotics. I'm sure a lot of you are kind of looking at robotics around your manufacturing processes. Um, but also then, you know, AI, how we use AI, and we've already seen cases where, you know, AI is taking on certain biases. Um, so this plays back into ESG, a lot of these things are very interconnected. Um, and then finally, the whole regulatory environment, um, you know, you, you have, I think, a fairly complex regulatory environment in India, um, but the, kind of the regulatory environment is ev everywhere is getting more complicated. And again, you know, you see as an example, you know, China and the US playing tit for tat, you know, imposing different regulations in relation to listing companies and so on. Um, so my, my story is that in addition to your traditional risks, you have to think about all these new areas of risk and it's very complicated and they're all interlinked. Um, but as risk managers, that's what we have to do. We have to evolve our, our, um, you know, our risk management practices to encompass these things as we go forward. Okay, so perhaps, so again on, on this slide, um, I've kind of you know almost used up my time. So um, I'm not again, I'm not going to go one by one through these things. But again, you know, this just stresses back to some of the points I'd mentioned. So you know, for example, you know your supply chain, um, you know people will hold you responsible not only for what you're doing as companies, but also what's happening in your supply chain. You know, are things being manufactured in places which are sort of substandard in relation to the employee environment? Um, so, you know, these are things. So you need to look at not only what you're doing, but what's happening down your supply chain and own that. Um, in mergers and acquisitions, all the things you've always had to look for, you still have to look for. But then you need to think about this company that we're acquiring. Do they have any legacy issues in relation to uh, ESG? Um, you know, are they using emerging technology? Are there some risks around this? So again, like everything becomes more complicated. All the traditional risks, you know, plus the uh, plus the new risk. Um, your international litigation, you know, we've sort of you know talked about this. Um, so again, and some of these other areas on the right are areas that uh, I've talked about. But again, the point is, they're new areas. They're difficult to manage. We have to make an effort to manage them and understand them, uh, and they all kind of you know, work together and amplify. Uh, each other. So, you know, it, it's a complex world. And I think, you know, as risk managers, um, you, know, could, you know, we've probably sort of never been in more demand than we are now and probably will be in the near future. So in that sense, as risk managers, I think, you know, you're, you're all going to be uh, in, in high demand in, you know, coming years. Okay, now, I think my colleague Adam now, who runs the multinational business specifically for the region, I believe is going to sort of pick up uh, from here. Great, thank you, Paul. Uh, so if we just wait and see how the, um, the poll results for this next question come in. So I'll just give you a few moments to answer that one. Okay, right, so we've got basically all of the above. So if we just go on to the next slide. And really that's the, the, the challenge that you have as risk managers. So if you look at the, the right-hand side of this slide where we're talking about coverage, cost, compliance, these are all the factors that you have to weigh up and figure out what your company's risk appetite is. Um, what are the things that you put most emphasis on? And then, how are you going to go about designing a program um, that, that matches uh, those particular goals that you have? Now, that in itself is complex anyway. You've got three very broad categories there. You've probably got your finance director really pushing on you to save costs. You've got your compliance officer saying, you know, do not do anything that is going to, going to end us up in courts. 
Um, and then you've got your, your risk manager hat on going, am I actually covering as effectively as I possibly can um, all the risks that are here? And, and as Paul mentioned, you know, those risks are, are multiple. If you then frame that against the added complexity that the second you go out of your own headquartered country, you're going into a totally different regulatory environment. And again, the, the, the map on the left here just shows you some of the complexity that you have to, have to, have to navigate around and find your way forward um, when you're dealing with admitted, non-admitted, cash before cover, um, and all these various issues that just multiply the complexity of, of, of the job that you have to do. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, we'll just talk about some of the ways that we can handle this. Um, so again, you know, Paul, Paul touched on all of these different risks, and these risks just keep on coming, and, and, and they're not just the traditional risks of property and casualty and, uh, and DNO. We're going into, into far more sort of nebulous risks, um, you know, some of them about how to you defend yourself against active risk investors, um, and obviously the cyber issues that, that, we, that we've touched on. Um, and again, as I said, is that when you go when you go global, everything that you've got there suddenly changes as well with the, with the global dynamic and what you may have in, in in your domestic environment in terms of natural catastrophe exposures, um, regulatory exposures could completely change when you go to a different place. So um, if you suddenly make an acquisition in, let's say, Germany, um, you know, flooding is depending on where you are, flooding could be a, a very large issue. If you're going to the U.S. Um, that, that your liability exposures suddenly completely change to what they are in, in, in um, other parts of Asia, for example. So again, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to juggle all these different dynamics um, and, and, and figure out at the same time probably how you can get the most effective cost. So up here, we've put, we put three examples, but the reality is, is that there can be any number of examples. Um, and I think one of the first things to say is that there is no perfect solution. There is always going to be a degree of compromise and you're always weighing up what your risk and your appetite is versus what the market can take. Um, I think the other key thing to, to, to notice here is that we very deliberately use the word evolution. And again, as a company that is either already with a global footprint or, or a company that is um, about to expand, um, you're not going to suddenly get yourself into a very sophisticated controlled master program overnight. It takes time, it takes infrastructure, um, it takes a lot of planning. So, so again, what we've put here is that there is a, that there is a huge time element to this um, and commitment about how you're gonna, how you're gonna um, work through possibly some of these options. So very crudely, what I've done is I've, I've just put up here, um, one approach is just this decentralized approach. And this is where you just, you're buying insurance individually in each of those countries. Um, and, and, each time you come up against a country, you're just going to be mapping out what are the risks and exposures that you have, what is the regulatory environment you have, and then just buying um, a, a policy that handles with that risk in isolation. Um, what that means is that depending on how many countries you've got, you've just got a collection of all sorts of policies. They'll all say slightly different things. Um, they'll typically be with different, rather, they'll almost certainly be with different carriers. Um, and it's just a very highly administrative, labor-intensive job to try and pull that together. And you're not really taking a, a company-wide risk philosophy to, to any one of these approaches. Um, you're just trying to, to, to have something that, that broadly does what it, what it needs to do. Um, as, you, as, you, as you mature or, or, or time passes, you typically want to go into a more coordinated approach. This is where you start establishing what is it that my, what is my risk philosophy as, as a company? What is it that are, are the must-haves? Where is it that I actually want to have consistency of cover? Um, it could be that you've also got assets in, in various different countries where there are peak exposures. So you may have um, a number of assets, let's say across Asia, where broadly, the, the, let's say there's a number of manufacturing plants and they've got relatively similar exposures, but then you've got one huge plant in China, for example, and, and the risk exposure in China is very different. The regulatory environment in China is very different. Um, are there opportunities to, to, to save cost in China using domestic markets? So maybe you'll, you'll, you'll carve something out separately there, as well as having maybe something different in, in India as well. So that's obviously a step improvement from the decentralized approach, um, but there's still a lot of inconsistency. There's still a lot of, uh, a lot of admin that's involved there. Um, so typically what a lot of the, um, the more mature multinational companies aspire towards is something what we, what we call a controlled master program. 
Um, and this is where you are. Um, actually, if we, if we go on to the next slide, we, we, we can see a sort of more detailed approach of, of, of how we look at a controlled master program. So, sorry, can we go to the next slide? Oh, yes, one more. Okay, so, so here, th this is one where, you know, what is it that you're trying to achieve with a controlled master program? You're, you're looking to have um, a single program ultimately, um, and that's typically with one lead insurer. And then what you do is you, you, you build in what are the exposures that you want to have covered. And then wherever possible, you try to have the local policy mirror the master program. Um, now, this is not always possible in certain jurisdictions. There may be um, mandatory requirements in certain countries. Um, but broadly, you want to get it as close as possible um, to the master program. Again, that is you imposing your risk philosophy across all of your assets and not relying on, on something that is happening within the country. Um, now, for this, there's, there's different access points of how you deal with either your broker or either with your, with, with your insurer. Um, but again, you know, what, what you're looking for here is that where there are any gaps in any particular country, your master policy will sit on top of these local policies, um, typically with a difference in conditions or a difference in limits to ensure that you're protecting your balance sheet um, as, as a global entity um, beyond just what the local entity is, is, is buying in country. Um, so again, this is something which if we just go on to the next slide, you'll see some of the, some of the benefits that this typically brings. So here, you know, one of the main things we talk about is consistency. Um, there can be cost efficiencies. That's it, I say can, because actually in some places, depending on the country you're going to, there could be an extremely competitive local market um, and they would, they would compete aggressively with a single large international insurer who would have the ability to handle a large master program. So cost efficiencies, you'd expect that there would be some uh, economies of scale, but there could also be um, particular isolated examples where it may be cheaper to go a, a local route. But again, this gives you the flexibility to do that. And then very, you know, as, as, as a sweeping statement, I'd say the rest of the comments are really about simplicity of communication. So again, as a risk manager, we've already established that you have a, a tremendously difficult job bringing together everything um, that is on your plate and, and, and all the requirements of, of your business and, and your various stakeholders. And so how can we pull something together that makes your life easy? So ease of administration, you're typically dealing with one, one lead insurer. Um, yeah, in terms of a claim, if a claim happens, you've still got the master insurer who's gonna start appointing um, you know, the loss adjusters, have it um, adjusted within, a, within broadly a common wording. Um, again, when it comes to evidencing, evidencing insurance, that process is a lot simpler. And again, when it comes to assessing what the program design is gonna be, um, you'll have more flexibility and you'll know who you're talking to. On the negative side, which I haven't necessarily focused on so much here, is that you, you are limited to the number of carriers who actually have the ability to execute an international master program. Um, so again, then that's when you might be wanting to consider what is the balance that you have with the local policies, the underliers and the master program that sits on top of that. Um, so this is just something to think about. As I said, it's, it's a vast, vast topic and, and we, you know, we are short on time. So what I'll do is just go on to the final slide from, from my point, my perspective, which is you know, what is the, the Marsh advantage? What are some of the things that we, that, that we can do to help? Now, I'm not gonna focus on, on everything here. In fact, the one I'm really gonna focus on is the one in the top right, which is our insurance regulatory and tax practice. Now, this is something which is entirely unique to Marsh. No other broker has this. Um, and the reason we have this is we have a, a, a leader called Praveen Sharma who sits in London. Um, he's a qualified accountant. He used to work on our captive business. Um, he is there because what we have seen, uh, and, and we've really seen this happen, particularly in the last um, 12 to 18 months, is that the scrutiny that is applied to global programs by local regulators is only going one way. It is increasing and increasing rapidly. Um, where in the past it was okay to try and walk the tightrope of, of admitted and non-admitted, um, what we're finding, and maybe it's a consequence of COVID, is that governments are looking for ways to recover money. And some of the ways that they're looking at is, is are multinationals behaving in the way that they are expected to and required to by law? So one of the main things that Praveen and his team do is that they will look at a client, look at a prospect, and they will map out what their exposures are in each of the countries and what is 
what is the most compliant way to structure a program um, that will not introduce fines, that will not introduce tax issues in the event that a claim could happen, um, and, and give you a nasty surprise when you're expecting money to be paid in, in a certain place, um, but you suddenly realize that the program has been structured incorrectly, um, and you're going to have to suddenly pay a large tax element, not on the premium you paid, but on the claim amount that would be, be repatriated to the country where you need it. So again, this is something where we're seeing a huge amount of demand for this. Um, and it's something which, which is really helping our multinationals navigate this increasingly complex and increasingly scrutinized um, area by, by, by the governments and the regulators. Um, the only other thing I really talk about is just one of the things we're doing around, um, around uh, technology to try and make our, the lives of our clients easier. And again, access something in one place is that we have our our global tool, which is called Marsh Global Connect, which will ultimately feed into a system called Link. Um, and this is a game where you can, you, you'll be able to analyze um, the limits you are buying, analyze your total cost of risk um, across all of your countries. Um, and again, make it easier for you to articulate um, up the ladder within your organization around what you're spending, where you're spending, why you're spending it, um, and, 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 and be able to give that storyboard around what your risk philosophy is. So from my side of things, hopefully that's, that gives you a, a brief summary of A, empathy to you on how difficult your job is as risk managers and the challenges you're facing, but some of the things that you can consider to make your life easier. Um, so Pranav, back to you. Thanks. We, we now move on to the panel discussion. And over to you, Sahil. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Pradhan, and uh, thank you, Paul, uh, Adam, as well as Sanjay, for a very uh, insightful presentation. Uh, firstly, I would like to uh, welcome our panel speakers and thank you very much for joining us, uh, Jolly Sir Nitin, uh, this evening for, for a very engaging discussion. So, uh, as Sanjay spoke, the, the entire theme that we have now, so having, I mean, the the economy and the country has got, has slid in the backdrop of COVID-19 in 2020. And now, at this point of time, every organization is looking at adopting measures so that they can become more resilient and they'll be better prepared to sort of avoid recurrence of such situations again. So, so with that theme in mind, I would like to uh, my direct the first question to Jolly sir. So, so Jolly sir, when uh, an organization uh, actually expands overseas, what according to you are the key challenges that are faced by the risk manager? Well, thanks, Sahil. Uh... So whenever I heard, uh, you know, hear the word challenges or the synonyms of challenges, I go back to my school days, you know, it was uh, uh, my first day in class 10 and, you know, we were all, you know, nervous, frightened and afraid that, you know, we have entered to a class where in the board exams would be there, you know, and uh, it was the first period of that physics and my teacher uh, told, it's not to me, to everyone that, you know, why you people are so frightened, afraid and nervous, you know, and it means that shows that you are lagging behind your prerequisites, what is required for you, uh, for, for pre-planning, uh, you know, uh, for the board exams and for the class 10, you know. And then he correlated with the conversations of uh, Albert Einstein with, the, with its, uh, you know, professor. And uh, uh, it was, you know, uh, the professor asked everyone uh, in the Albert Einstein's uh, classroom, then if the God has created everything, you know, it means that evil has also been created by the God. You know, it means, you know, who to blame? Everything has been created by God. And every student was mum. But it was Albert Einstein who stood up and said, you know, uh, sir, does cold exist? He, Albert Einstein asked that, uh, you know, professor. So professor asked, uh, you know, replied back, you know, that's stupid question. The cold uh, exists, you know. And Einstein replied, no, it does not, you know. Cold does not exist, you know. It is, uh, in fact, reality is an absence of heat, you know. And then again, he asked Albert Einstein second questions, you know, does darkness exist, you know? The professor, uh, you know, replied back, yes, it, it does exist. Einstein replied, no, it does not. It is a, in reality, is an absence of light, you know. Similarly, he said that, you know, the evil does not exist. It's an absence of God. So correlating that things, you know, my teachers, you know, told us that, you know, if you are frightened, nervous and afraid, it means that, you are a lack of wisdom, inner drive, 
persistence and the committed passions required for you to do anything you know so but for for today's discussion i believe you know let's presume it that the challenges do exist you know and let's solve this by a pythagoras theorem you know first we presume it that that do exist but when we'll mitigate these things you know with a desired strategies at the end of the day you will find that these do not do not exist you know and in terms of the challenges i believe you know first challenge is that Uh, different risk philosophy risk appetite and risk cultures are there when you go out you know and idea is to weave that everything in a single dna that is act as if you are uninsured second is the country's local regulations and the local tariff because we'll have to handle the local uh, two two regulators one is the banking another is that insurance you know so that is also a kind of an you know challenge third is heterogeneous and diverse risk coverages when you are going out you know for each and every country next is a language barrier because i am handling the 50 countries you know uh, if you don't have a kind of an fully equipped ecosystem with you know fine inner and outside teams you know you will find this kind of an uh, language barriers you know while vetting the documents or so another is rationalization and consolidations of the uh, you know kind of an risk programs poor resonance with that existing setup and blending in accordance with my thought process and fashion is another challenge and i believe the last one is a gdpr you know if you are handling with that european country especially is you know and if you are uh, handling that uh, employee benefit program the gdpr you will have to take it into a mind because a little slippage in that you know will will land you in a great troubles you know so i believe these are the challenges uh, you know when you go outside thank you thank you jolly sir and uh, thank you for sharing it in such a simplified way by relating it to your experience uh, my next question is uh, for nitin so nitin with the changing uh, risk landscape what key steps do you think should indian multinational companies take to risk fence themselves both from the traditional risks as well as from the emerging risks thanks i you know i think it's a brilliant question you've asked because i think um, what is important today is to uh, understand what is an emerging risk that you know i just paul said it's it's not an only an emo, emerging risk which is something which is new it's something which is a familiar risk you know which has always been there but it is now in a new form or a new and with a new condition today so with regard to you know when you say emerging risk it's like it can be like you know from include new technologies like artificial intelligence or genetic engineering Uh, social uh, or environmental uh, changes which is there or even like you know how uh, adam was saying you know the regulatory of the local uh, you know uh, country in which uh, you know you are or you will be doing business in so eventually you know when you say why is it such a big concern today because we don't know what it is it is not understood completely we don't have data it, it comes with so many surprises so i think the lack of data in and in in, a, in an emerging risk is something which is uh, you know which how to how to deal with that you, you may it, certainly that old traditional risk management techniques may not be so effective you know in the, it needs to be tweaked a bit well, because you say risk identification or assessment all this is part of our risk management techniques but it needs to be tweaked and changed as per what you know today uh, the new changes that is happening or the kind of risk that is been coming up now coming to mncs you know i think you know um, one of the main advantages for an mnc company is that they are geographically spread it's completely uh, you they have the experiences of other geographies which maybe not you know the uh, may not have the similar kind of impact but some kind of geography may have a full bone effect so keeping that in mind uh, you know mnc's in india can plan prepare you know the way uh, you know or, or foresee the kind of uh, losses that can come in under this emerging risk which we are talking about so in all if i have say the the early identification of a potential change in the risk landscape is the key to it so you know for example we have cyber risk we totally thought that it was banking or it was to a financial uh, institution but no this now today we have manufacturing companies also being affected with that so 
I think the the impact is seen now. You know, we never thought yes, cyber risk always had was always a threat. Well, you know, they been 2017 uh, onwards, or if you can say they were uh, a few years back, there were some of the reinsurers came up and said, hey, uh, there would be a disease or there would be pandemic kind of disease which reinsurers have identified, but nobody thought about it. Just like things stick today. So as far as the companies who had considered these kind of risk and had taken adequate, uh, you know, the policy in a moderate risk, you know, they could sustain the today's environment or they could sustain the change in risk that has happened. So I think that's that's all about when we talk about, you know, but in today's risk managers in today's world, I think they have successfully recognized and provisioned in not only losses to, uh, you know, as, which occur in a bubble, like maybe not only marine or transit, it's, they understand the the domino effect that happens in case, you know, in, in case of a loss. For example, the you know we have a Suez Canal. You know, we had property, we had transit, we have liability from a single loss. So this is this is something which has changed. I am sure that today today's risk managers are seeing the risk in a much wider way than in you know only in a it's in a bubble. So all in all, if I have to say is uh, you know it's it's the right balance between proactive and reactive approach. Uh, a successful by mitigation of conventional and emerging risk depends upon you know, the skill to see the correlation between these two. You know? uh, yeah, and also the, you know, realign the experience of the managing the conventional uh, risk to deal with the new emerging risk. Thank you, thank you, Nitin. I think the, the the key message is the balance between the proactive and the reactive uh, risk management approach. So thank you, thank you for your input, uh, Paul. I would like to we like to understand from your side that from a global perspective, when companies actually expand their footprint, what sort of risk management strategies are they adopting at this point of time? Yeah, um, thank you. So, so really, just to build on what Mr. Jolly said and what Nitin said, I think we all recognise the complexity of it. So you know the the old risk management tools of you know uh, risk identification uh, risk analysis risk control and monitoring these things apply still so the basic framework applies but you've got to apply it to these new areas so we need to build models in the new areas so you know there are cyber models we can build to help companies now to understand what your risk exposure is whether or not you buy insurance is secondary the primary function is to look for what is whatever is out there to help you to understand the risk, first of all, and then everything goes from there. Thank you, thank you, Paul. So, Pranav, if I can just request to share, would you like to share some insights on, on this from an Indian context? Absolutely, I think uh, very relevant. And, you know, uh, I'd say understanding the risk management culture, you know, when uh, an Indian company is going abroad to various geographies, so there's a huge cultural difference each geography has its own culture uh, with regard to risk retention, risk transfer, risk mitigation. So understanding the differences in culture and bridging this gap, bringing about a gradual transformation to bring about uniformity across geographies, that would be uh, the aim that uh, you know, uh, a corporation would like to achieve. So uh, I'd say uh, you know, this would be uh, you know, the approach that one should follow. Uh, when it comes to uh, you know uh, facing and, and dealing with the challenges. Thank you, thank you, Pranav. So, Nitin, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, if we if we look at Indian multinational companies, we spoke about the evolution in the insurance purchase behavior. How it's going a step back. What do you, what are your thoughts on uh, on centralized insurance and risk management function versus a completely decentralized one? I think it's an interesting question what you put up. Uh, I'm sure my uh, colleagues, uh, you know, would uh, really be so eager to know what I'm saying here. So I think when it comes to, uh, you know, multinational companies, there's both way to it. You either, you know, look at it, it's got its pros and cons in both the sides. You know, both approaches its own, own way. A centralized, uh, you know, approach would give you a better control. Uh, you have a process which is put up for the entire, uh, you know, which is seamlessly across the group. Uh, or uh, you know, it has 
it means there's lost less of friction and deviations that happens locally, you know, for that part. So the, when it goes on, you know, negotiating power today, in, in fact, if I am looking at to negotiate my portfolio, when I have a centralized uh, team or a centralized policy product or centralized policy, it, it, it would give me a much more uh, better negotiation power than in being a decentralized. But, you know, life is never so easy. And I wished it was, uh, but certain geographies, like, you know, how Adam was saying, you know, certain countries, uh, you, you really don't know how the locals are, or the local regulations are, or the local needs are. Uh, maybe if, for example, like if an African country, you know, the, if it is always better to have a local based policies than having a centralized uh, policy. Uh, at the same time, I would say uh, it's, you know, sitting in India or in America, it's not easy to handle uh, a policy which is in such countries are, you know, such geographical locations would be. But at the same time, I would, uh, I would not, uh, you know, agree to have completely decentralized. Uh, I would certainly say that it has to be partially, uh, maybe decentralized, have more control uh, on, and it has to have a decentralized program, but probably it has to be uh, controlled centralized. You know, Thank you. Right. Instead of others, will end up working into a very, you know, people would have their own policies and working in a bubble, and you will not have any hang of, uh, and not have an effective risk management for that. True. Well, thank you. Dita. I think yeah, that's the perspective about maintaining a balance. So just taking this this point forward with Jolly sir, uh, Jolly sir, how if you if you look at the emphasis on the centralized risk management approach, how do you think does this complement the overall risk management philosophy of an organization? So thanks, Ahil, again. Um, I'll take an analogy of the human body system first. I think that will help us understand, you know, what this central, uh, you know, uh, that insurance and risk management says, how does this help, you know, actually in an organization? So in a human body, we do have, uh, you know, 10 independent uh, body systems like, you know, cardiovascular, digestive, endocrine, exocrine, lymphatic, muscular, you know, renal, reproductive, rest, uh, respiratory, skeleton, you know, these, these all independent body systems, you know, work on their own, like, you know, cardiovasculars, you know, that circulate blood, you know, deliver oxygens, you know, keep the body temperature in a safe range, you know, similarly, digestive uh, systems, you know, it absorbs nutrients and, you know, eliminates waste. And likewise, you know, every, each and every body system has its own functions, but, you know, Putting together everyone or individually, they cannot do anything unless the master body system, that is a nervous system, you know, comes into a place. And, you know, this nervous system has, you know, kind of three functions, like, you know, it helps other body systems to communicate with each other, you know. It also reacts to changes both inside and outside the body. And it also uses both chemicals and, you know, electricals mean to send and receive messages you know if we have you know kind of a malfunction this nervous system whether it is cns or pns central nervous system or peripheral nervous system if we don't have the cns or pns you know all the independent you know body systems won't work you know so that is why you know the central insurance and related risk management approach is is utmost important, although I do agree with Nitin that, you know, there is, you know, there are some risks and some perils which needs to be taken care of, decentralized, you know, but overall that centralized approach will help us, you know, and what are the advantages of, uh, you know, this uh, centralized self, you know, now I think we would have understood, you know, keeping this mind, the CNS and PNS, you know, the how this centralized insurance uh, works it. So first and foremost benefit is that, you know, it is integrated and harmonized different verticals, you know, whether it is underwriting, claims, compliance, you know, accounting, budgeting, everything you, you, you know, think of, you know, all things can be effectively integrated and harmonized, you know. Second, that delivery and accountability, you know, from cradle to the grave, you know, because if there are something which is in, which falls in the no man's lands, you know, you know, we will, will lands into our troubles, you know. From credit to the grave, accountability has to be through a single source, you know. Third is that process excellence through the quantum theory of risk management, you know, because 
coming back to this you know sort of nervous systems you know we have a billions of neurons you know so you know so so if, if each and every neuron will be stitched to each other by sending you know uh, communications by coordinating everything you know similarly when you crystallize your visions up to the quantum levels you know you will you will kind of you know having a you know a real success and that can be done through quantum theory of risk management if you are managing centrally you know uh, i do myself you know crystallizing vision to approximately uh, i think 21708 activities as of today you know and these 21708 are my neurons you know each and every activities split down then putting a life into it you know and another benefit is that there has to be a air air tight control on the key acquire total cost of insurable risk you know because your focus is you know kind of you know that you have to control is everything whether it is premium or the you know cost of unsettled claim whether it is the cost of you know um, you know uh, risk improvement or a self retained risk you know putting together the key quads has to be controlled then another benefit is that you know uniform risk management practices are followed you know internationally then cross territory learning this is very important the cross territory learning to be implemented if i have learned anything from my one countries territory that immediately implemented to the another countries as well you know then one risk language within inverted comma bold italic underline act as if you are uninsured this is a common risk language that needs to be taught to each and every stakeholder unless they are aware of this risk language everything would be futile you know then you know uh, one common technology platform because technology is a real enabler at the at the moments you know if we not take into account that technologies you know we won't be successful in any area whether it is insurance risk management or anything so you know. and i think if we we'll do everything bringing world together would be imminent you know that has to come to your way i i think these are the advantages of some place thank thank you sir i think that's a very insightful and detailed perspective on the importance of a centralized risk management approach Uh, so adam uh, you touched upon the the uh, the concept about the centralized the control master program so just looking at it from a uh, program administration perspective what are the key ingredients according to you which would ease the entire administration for risk management yeah thanks prav well i think i think jolly sir has has touched on a, a number of fantastic points there um i think from my side of things i'll really just take focus on three things one of them is the the instructions are critical that go out and and by that understand you know we touched on the complexity of what you've got here if you get it wrong the consequences when a claim happens are ugly so spend the time get it right use a specialist to help you understand what are the environments you're about to go into and what the risks are and make sure you've got it right secondly is you know, the, the communication between center and and the and the um countries is critical and and for that as a broker we're very lucky we have a, a you know significant network and it's a largely owned network so again we're going to people who are part of our team so giving consistent instructions clear instructions is is a critical advantage for us um and finally again you know jolly sir touched on it which is the it's the technology and and having a platform which is brings it all together and again we're lucky we have a single platform um and and which means that the instructions are going out on that platform the information is captured on that platform the analytics can be can be can be gathered and, and analyzed using that platform um and again it just gives consistency of communication so so those would be my three points thank you thank you Adip. that that's that's very interesting so so my last question is uh, is to pranam and i think this is a question which the entire audience will also be very keen to know about so pranam from uh, from an indian context uh, for indian multinational companies how equipped is the indian insurance and reinsurance market to structure global programs or to structure control master programs thanks i i would say uh, there are capabilities in the indian insurance market to structure and lead uh control master programs we have insurance companies and we have foreign reinsurer branches that have capabilities have that have capacity to uh lead a control master program however i'll just put a caveat you know when the values are large 
uh, by large, you know, I wouldn't like to be even open-ended, but, but uh, uh, without being held to my word, I'd say, you know, uh, greater than half a billion dollars of PIV. So when the values are large, we need more capacity. That's when the Indian market may not be able to fill up 100% of the capacity. We need to go to cross-border, we need insurers, uh, you know, to the international market uh, for filling up the capacity. Now, uh, I would say there are two important criteria when uh, selecting uh, the right leader for the control master program. Uh, one is network strength, very, very important. You need to have an insurance company with a strong network. And secondly, capacity. Uh, to lead, there needs to be you know, sufficient capacity to justify being a leader. It can't just be a small line. Uh, this being said, uh, I'll also like to emphasize that it's not just the network strength of the insurance company. Uh, it's also the network strength of the broker. That's very, very important. So it's a combination of two. The network strength of the insurer and the broker that will bring about successful uh, execution of a control master program. But just to answer your question, uh, you know, again, in, in summary, there are capabilities in the Indian insurance market that need to be supplemented with international capacity, depending on the insured value. Thank you. Thank you, Pranav. I think that would raise a lot of confidence in the mind of the audience as well. So I would like to thank the entire panel for a very insightful discussion. I would, uh, we would now open the floor for the open house and uh, over to you, Pranav, for the q &A. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sahil. So uh, we've had questions that have been, uh, you know, raised by participants at the time of registration. So we'll answer them first. And uh, there are also uh, questions, uh, you know, in the Q&A tab. So we can come to that uh, after this is done. So uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, uh, address this question to Paul Wilkins. It's been raised by uh, Sandeep Shemke. Uh, so Paul, if you can uh, answer Sandeep's question, that what is the future of risk management in the long run? I'd say a very broad question, and uh, you know, if you can throw some light on that. Yeah, Pram. Um, I, I think it's like I said in my uh, earlier remarks. Um, you can only you can only you imagine that. I think it's very very clear to all of us that the risk landscape um, has become more complicated for us, and I don't think it's suddenly going to become less complicated. So you will have to operate in this new, more complex environment. So if the risk environment is more complicated. I can only assume that the risk manager in an organization or the person responsible for risk for risk is going to be an increasingly important person in that organization. That's not to say that they're not already, um, but I think there will be an increasing prominence of the role of the of the risk manager. And clearly, you know, risk management is not going away. It's only getting uh, it's only getting bigger. Yeah, thanks, Paul. So coming to the next question, it's uh, raised by Mr. Sethu Ram. And uh, I'd like to address it to Dolly, sir. Uh, how does an organization assess the adequacy of its risk management systems with the changing risk landscape? Dolly, sir. Thanks, thanks, Pranav. Uh, so, in astrophysics, you know, one term is called dark energy. You know, which says that universe is on a perpetual expansion. You know, that's right. And every single minute, a new galaxies are being created. And so does that apply to us, you know. Change is an imminent, you know. I cannot say is that I will lock myself in a, in, a, in a room and that change would not apply to me. I'm not decoupled to these changes, you know. That has to be, you know, applied to me, you know. So because of this ever dynamic risk environment, you know, uh, we as a risk manager faces opportunities and a threat at a pace which is very much different from that of the past, you know. And in order for us to be ahead of the crowd and ahead of the curve, you know, we'll have to prepare ourselves well in advance, you know, uh, because this is the real mantra, because there is always a black swan. Nobody knows, you know, which way the next ball will turn out, but we'll have to prepare ourselves, you know, in order to, you know, uh, uh, kind of, you know, taming down uh, the bad risk and leveraging the opportunity because to my mind, you know, risk is not only that bad risk. You know, if you see the definition of risk, I, I guess so 31,000, it says, you know, it's a four word definition. Risk is an effect of uh, uncertainties on objectives, you know, and that effect can be a plus and can be a minus, you know, depending upon how we perceive, we see the world the way we perceive it, you know, and God has wrapped this opportunity in the inner layer, you know, on the outer layer, there is a threat, you know, 
in an inner layer, there is an opportunity. Even every risk, you know, even every bad risk is having a good, good opportunity in this, you know. So we'll have to leverage the opportunity as well, continuously demystifying the risk environment and see, you know, how best we can do. And for this, you know, challenging the risk assumptions, you know, risk constraint and underlying risk opportunity needs to be spinned off perpetually through our conscious and subconscious mind. It is very important, you know. And, you know, regular risk focus studies, regular, you know, fine tuning between risk and your mitigation strategies, it is very, very important. And whether you do it on the parallel basis, whether you do it on the risk basis, but you know, it is it is a balance sheet. You know, Pranav. If you if you can say is that balance sheet as on thirty first March two thousand twenty one. You know, the balance sheet of April first two twenty one, a day after. You know, cannot match them. You know, there has to be an incremental delta change there. You know, I cannot say is that whatever G S Jolly is saying as of fifth of August would be good enough for, you know, 6th of August as well, you know, we breathe and we age, you know, with every breath, you know, millions of cells are replaced, you know, with the new millions of cells, you know, I'm not a GS Jolly when started this discussions, you know, I'm a different GS Jolly because, you know, human body is a combination of trillions of cells, you know, so what I'm saying is that change is an imminent, you know, will have to spin off perpetually, you know, and this is, this is how we can do that, you know. It's such a dynamic uh, environment that we have to adapt to change. So yeah. uh, very useful pointer, sir. So the next question was again by Mr. Sefudam, and I'd like to direct this one to uh, Adam. Uh, so if you can answer this, Adam, uh, are there case studies which explain the cost benefit analysis of risk management? Yeah, okay. I mean, cost benefit analysis of risk management, that's, um, I mean, the basics of risk management is that you're taking preventative measures. Um, so again, it's it's um, it's very difficult to quantify um, what would have happened had you not taken that action. Um, so I think my answer to that would really be you know, my background is 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 in energy. Um, and if I look at some if I look at some of the, the big disasters that have happened, um, you know, we used to publish up what well, we still do the hundred largest losses. That, that's your cost benefit analysis. If, if you aren't taking risk, a solid risk management approach, these things are, are likely to happen. Um, this is something where when you, when you analyze the 100 largest losses that have happened globally, um, nearly all of them come down to human error and some breach of risk management. Um, so again, I think you know, for, for me, we can, we can pr provide any level of detail for that. At the, at the other end of the spectrum, which is when you're talking about maybe more attritional losses, um, obviously, companies have lost time incidents, um, and, and, and they, they'll be measuring those. And, and within Marsh, our advisory team are very much helping clients with their risk matrix. So again, looking at um, severity versus consequence, just a, a very common tool, tool within risk management. And really, that's just helping you to prioritize where it is that you invest in risk management. Um, but that is, that is, if you need help quantifying what the likelihood of those risks are, uh, and, and where it is worth spending money, that is basically what our, our, risk, uh, our risk advisory team will do. They will make recommendations and they will be prioritized based on the severity of the outcome if you were not to improve that level of risk management. Absolutely, Adam. And I think the analytics tools that we possess uh, will really play an important role in arriving at the cost benefit analysis or risk management. So thanks for that, Adam. The next question again by Mr. Setulam, I'd like to direct this one to Nitin. So Mithin, if you can uh, please answer this one. So where will you place Indian corporates vis-a-vis -vis corporates in Asia, European Union, and the US in risk management practices and their mitigation? Yeah, I think uh, eventually the risk management is something, you know, you, you have a rational provisioning. Uh, is, is, you know, that's, that's all about, you can't have it too much or you can't have it less. If you look at which country, uh, Look, at the, every country is different. Every job is different. Uh, the way it is, uh, I think uh, the exposure that you have today is is across the globe. Uh, it depends on what kind of uh, you know business you're looking out for, what kind of uh, geography you're looking at, targeting upon. So it's it's never the same. But the basics would be the same, but uh, they would be certainly certain uh, you know countries uh, having its own kind of risk that would be there. So it would be different from each and every country. 
Right, right, Nitin. So uh, thanks for that. So uh, the message is that the ethos is the same. The spirit is the yeah. same. Yes. The way of implementing it is so different depending. Uh, so, you know, uh, what I had said earlier about the cultural difference. So the cultural difference, I'd say, uh, brings about the difference in the approach. Otherwise, the ethos and the spirit is very much the same. Absolutely. So the next question is by uh, Dharmesh Saxena. Uh, uh, I'll take this one. It says, uh, what are the steps taken by the Indian regulator to address insurance requirements for covering pandemic risks? So very, uh, very relevant question. And, you know, I'll just take a step back and uh, I'll go through the turmoil that we, uh, you know, underwent last year. And, uh, you know, when the lockdown was, uh, was announced, this was, uh, you know, starting from uh, uh, the end of March and it went on for a good three, four months. And uh, uh, so more than the regulator, you know, uh, Dharmesh, I would say it's the GIC. GIC uh, provides a bulk of the capacity for any risk in India. And uh, their stand is very important. So when GIC issues a circular, it's as good as, you know, a notification from uh, the regulator because insurance companies have to take it very, very seriously. So I'll come to your uh, question, but I think uh, as a, as a prep preparation for that, you know, it's important to just see the background. And uh, what happened last year is GIC put some restrictions in coverage when it came to unoccupied premises. Uh, you know, there were certain basic requirements uh, to be met as far as fire protection, uh, risk management, security, power supply are concerned. So these basic requirements have to be met for uh, for uh, uh, continuation and cover. And uh, there was also a lapse in, uh, in, in the PI. So this is what the, the, the steps that the GIC took, uh, you know, to uh, safeguard the interest of the Indian insurance market at the same time, bring the Indian insurance up to speed when it came to risk management. Now, uh, as a straight answer to your question, uh, you know, for pandemic risks, what is the regulator doing again? It's more, you know, from uh, uh, insurer and reinsurer perspective uh, that where my answer will lie. Uh, well, there is a product for non-damaged BI, but again, for pandemic risks, uh, it needs to be structured in a manner that will make it more palatable and more economic uh, to be bought by the average Indian insured. Uh, 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 while its capacity is being syndicated and you know this product is being uh, is being structured, it's still in its early stages. So as of now, you know there's no product in the local market using local capacity, but it's work in progress. So hopefully we will have a pandemic-based product. The difficulty in uh, really syndicating capacity for such a product is the exposure. It's such a huge exposure that uh, you know it's got to be uh, it's got to be designed in a proper manner. Uh, no insurance company really wants to burn its books in a manner which will completely, uh, you know, uh, wipe out the profits and reserves of many, many years. It's got to do justice uh, to, uh, you know, uh, the risk as well as uh, make it sustainable in the market. Uh, it should, you know, be sustainable for many, many years. So, uh, you know, that's my answer. Uh, and uh, now the last question is again by Anand Sampat. Uh, so I'll address this to Paul. Paul, if you can take this one. Does business continuity management and business continuity plan fold into enterprise risk management? Yes. <laughs> so uh, to expand on that, so again, if you go back to the framework of risk management, right? It's the yeah, identification risk, analysis of the, the risk, um, you, what controls can you put in place and then monitor it. So the controls are both things. They're the things you can do pre-event and they're the things you can do post-event to minimize those losses. So absolutely, business continuity management is a fundamental element of risk management. Um, and then when we look at these broader risk areas, and we talk about, as Sanjay talked at the start, thinking about how resilient are our companies, then absolutely it's a fundamental part of that. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Setulam has some more questions. So. Uh, Nilavani, can we please take Mr. Sethulam live? And you know, there's a very interesting question on risk estimation in each country. So I'll just read it out uh, while it's there on the screen. Risk estimation in each country differs. Is there a master template of thousand plus risks which one can study when an Indian company enters 
any country for the business it is planning to establish can this be shared so uh, if uh, yeah Sifu, uh, thank you so much for joining us and uh, yes uh, you know i'll just answer a question and you, you can feel free to cross question live uh, an international risk review is uh, you know uh, an exercise that uh, we carry out when uh, uh, an indian multinational is going overseas and uh, not just to one country but to several countries and this is uh, an assessment uh, of each geography when it comes to the local risks, local challenges, the compliances, uh, you know, the non-admitted versus admitted issues, the taxation issues. It's a, it's an, I'd say, an uh, all-encompassing, uh, you know, risk management exercise that should and must be carried out by uh, Indian MNCs going abroad. It gives you a snapshot of where you stand when it comes to the exposure, the, the risk exposures that you have at a global level. Uh, so uh, this, uh, I'd say, uh, you know, it, it, more than a template, it would be, uh, you know, uh, you know, connecting with uh, colleagues in different geographies and getting their views on the exposures based on uh, the Indian uh, company's, uh, you know, footprint. So does that answer your question, Sitar or, uh, or or do we need to uh, throw some more light on that? Uh, the the important aspect that uh, uh, we are an Indian company and then we are looking at establishing uh, facilities uh, in the Europe, European region and US. The important aspect is that uh, most of the times we don't have a kind of a template which, uh, which allows us to look at all kinds of risks that are pertinent to that region. We all know about the risks in India but we do not have a kind of a template wherein let's say there are thousand plus risks and we say okay is this risk relevant in that region or not most of the time what happens is that we go based upon an advice from a uh, risk consultant or risk management consultant and as we go ahead we realize oh no we have not looked at this risk. Oh no, we have not looked at this thing. So we keep adding as we find out. Now, when we do this, we started with some 25 risks and we added 10 risks and we don't know we have exhausted all. And suddenly after two years of operation, somebody else comes and says, oh, you, you didn't look at that risk. You didn't, you didn't insure yourself for that risk. So it becomes a kind of a learning exercise and grouping in the dark exercise to find out what is the risk. So if any risk management consultant or a risk management agency gives us, okay, here are thousand risks. Look at a template. All of it is not applicable, but have a look at them and find out whether they are applicable. It becomes, it makes the job a lot more easier to start with. And maybe, you know, you have done the exercise at the beginning itself perfectly. And this is the question. Is there, a, is, there a, is there some kind of a template? We do that in India. Incidentally, we are a manufacturing organization, pet chem derivatives organization, food ingredients organization. We do that. We do that for all of our manufacturing sites where we start with some 500, maybe 600 risks. And then slowly drill it down saying that, okay, here are ones which are very critical, here are ones which are not critical, here are ones where we need to cover, here are ones we don't. So we do that exercise in India. We can't do that in Europe because we don't know. We can't do that in US because we don't know. We can take the same template of India and then do that there. So this is the problem. This is the issue that I wanted to raise. Sethu Ramanji, I'll, uh, you know, uh, in the interest of time, I'll quickly, you know, uh, just answer it uh, uh, and we can connect offline and continue our discussion. Yes. So uh, we, we, our, our risk, I mean, just to uh, keep the uh, yeah. um, uh, point straight, uh, yeah. uh, in, in the U.S., Marsh is our concern. So. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Thank you so much, sir. So just to, uh, you know, uh, answer your question in a very crisp manner, uh, the templates would be very bespoke. So there's no fixed template. At the same time, like I said earlier, it begins with an international risk review, which captures the geography-specific risks followed by a risk map and a risk register, 
which would be an exercise carried out by your risk consultant and various departments within your organization, ranging from finance to, uh, to safety, to uh, operations and maintenance and uh, uh, you know, inspection. So it's a brainstorming exercise where you firstly list down the risks that you're exposed to, then whether they are insurable, not insurable, what the consequences are, what the severity is, and how to treat those risks irrespective of whether they're insurable or uninsurable, how to treat those risks. So this would be an exercise, uh, you know, which would take uh, uh, around, you know, depending on the size of operation, at least, you know, three days to carry out. And, uh, you know, you would uh, pick out the top risks from that. And, uh, you know, the result would be exactly what you're looking for. You know, the top risks in that geography and how they are to be treated. And Pran so, Pranav, would, would you mind if I, I just mentioned uh, to yeah, Prabhu? Yeah, yes. um, I, yeah I, I think it's a very, very good question and your response is actually spot on. So I think the answer is really, is uh, I, I believe we can help. Um, so maybe Pranav, by yourselves, we can have a separate discussion offline specifically, yeah. see how we can help. And then I'd just like to make that same offer to anybody else on the call. If anybody else, because we've run out of time, I think it's been a great discussion. If anybody has any specific questions or specific areas that we've talked about today, they would like to know more about or want to then, you know, please let your uh, you know, let colleagues in India know who will work with myself and Adam and you know, we'll, we'll work with our global organization uh, to see how, how we can help you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've got a, a very brief response into, into the thing. All I'd say is we would combine our multinational and industry experts to give you that benchmarking. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Paul, and thanks, Adam. Uh, well, on this note, uh, you know, uh, I'd see that, uh, you know, we've uh, crossed our uh, stipulated time. And I'd like to thank all the participants, all the panelists for such a lively and uh, insightful discussion. It's been a pleasure uh, interacting with all of you. So let's carry forward our uh, you know, uh, engagement and our uh, dialogue. So uh, our coordinates will be shared with all the participants and I'd encourage you to reach out to us for any knowledge sharing that we can do. It will be our pleasure to share our thoughts, insights, experiences, knowledge, and, uh, you know, uh, keep the engagement alive. So thank you so much. Uh, look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you. Thank you. So on this note, yes, I'll conclude the session. Thanks again. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.